College sports is more than a game at big time, big money programs like the University of Nebraska Lincoln. We'll talk about this with new Husker Director of Athletics Bill Moose today on Speaking of Nebraska. Welcome to Speaking of Nebraska, I'm Mike Tobias. We're back for eight weeks talking about a wide range of issues important to our state, plus an update on what's happening in the Nebraska legislature and a bit of Nebraska history. University of Nebraska Lincoln Athletics is big business, and that business has a new CEO. Bill Moose became director of athletics last October. He takes over one of a couple dozen programs that spend more than $100 million a year on sports and one of a smaller group of programs that pay for themselves without other university funding. We sat down with Moose last week at Memorial Stadium to talk about money, challenges, expectations, and broader issues connected with college athletics. But first, a little bit about Bill Moose. Our new athletic director at the University of Nebraska, Bill Moose. Bill. Less than a month after the firing of Sean Eichhorst, a man unknown to most Nebraskans assumed leadership of the Husker Athletic Department. Moose had been athletic director at his alma mater, Washington State. He also played football there. Before that, stints heading the athletics departments at Oregon and Montana. I want you to know that my motto has always been in the 25 years that I've been a Division I athletic director, and it will be here too, and it's very simple. Honor the past, live the present, create the future. When we met Bill Moose and we talked to him, it was so apparent that the fit to Nebraska was right. Moose takes over one of the nation's largest athletic departments, 22 sports and a budget of more than $100 million annually. It's a program with highs and lows during the 2000s. A volleyball team that won four national titles. But a football team that's floundered at the same time, leading to the firing of the last four football coaches and two of the last three athletic directors. Seems like we've been doing this a lot lately. That didn't deter um, Moose, who said he wholeheartedly wanted to run to this job. This is a storied place, and, and when you've been in the business as long as I have, and it's been a long time, and I'm proud of, of what we've accomplished at a, a couple other places, I, I, I want to bring a lot of that mentality to a place where we can be in a position to win championships in every sport. So we're sitting here in a Memorial Stadium room that celebrates Bob Devaney, national championships, Hall of Fame coaches. You're around this stuff every day. No pressure, right? <laughs> I don't feel any pressure, but uh, it is a storied place and uh, with some true icons uh, through the years. And someone in my profession uh, looks at the University of Nebraska uh, with a little bit of awe and a lot of respect. And uh, certainly I, I'm right in that group. You've been here about four months now. Um, general impressions of the athletic program here? Very proud athletic program. Again, at a great university. Uh, wonderful, hardworking people. Uh, good quality student athletes. I've been quite impressed. Uh, we will be making some changes, but uh, as is my uh, way of doing things, I wait a little bit after I've observed and assessed things and, and then uh, put my touch on it and, uh, and we take off and go. When you first arrived, obviously football and leadership of the football program was, was your focus and was job one. Now that that's you've dealt with that. Um, you talked about changes. What's, what's on your plate right now? Uh, really had to make a priority out of our football situation here. And uh, uh, so I had to 
table everything else and, and go to work on that. So uh, I think we're in good shape in that regard. Really feel good about uh, uh, the change that we did make in our future. And now I'm working on and focusing on primarily the staff itself and uh, how to administer it and, and uh, the very good people that we have. Some will be changing uh, their duties and maybe adding some personnel as well. Some structural changes? Yes. And uh, it's all about communication, I believe. Uh, having a blueprint that everyone uh, has bought into and believes in and then implementing that blueprint to uh, move us towards uh, success in all 24 of our sports and put us in a position to compete for championships year in and year out. I want to talk more broadly about issues related to college athletics. And as you look at the landscape for college athletics, what, what concerns you most right now? I, I think the debate over uh, amateurism versus professionalism. Uh, are these young people uh, in it for the money? Are they in it for the education? Are they in, in to it for the experience? Uh, this is, these are questions that are being asked these days. And uh, college athletics is big business. Uh, budgets uh, that are on an annual basis, all the way up to 150, close to $200 million a year. Huge uh, uh, stadiums and arenas very lucrative television deals, uh, shoe and apparel contracts, all uh, the sponsorships that uh, are out there today. It really is truly a big business and I've seen it grow over my 25 years as a major college athletic director uh, in leaps and bounds and makes one wonder where it's going to go from here. Yeah, because Nebraska is one of those handful of schools that spends over $100 million a year on, on athletics. And, and, you know, here that spending has almost doubled since 2005 when it was about $56 million. Why has this become such an expensive business? Well, the cost of the education has gone up. Just the, the uh, tuition, uh, board and room fees and books, those, those have all increased. Travel expense to... Uh, get get teams and individuals to other universities to compete, and the cost of equipment, the uh, the the cost of, uh, of of the employees that we have and the benefits that we provide, it adds up pretty fast. And uh, before you know it, you we we see budgets doubled as as you mentioned in in just uh, a, a short period of time. And again, it makes one stop and think, where are we gonna be in another 10, 15, or 20 years in regards to the expense in, in operating one of these programs? In, in the term arms race comes up pretty frequently when you look at where some of the money is going. Are we in a college athletics arm ra arms race right now? Uh, well, I think we are in many regards, and a lot of that has centered around facilities and uh, the need to attract the good young talent uh, nowadays uh, necessitates having facilities that uh, will lure them uh, in uh, regards to being able to become the best they can be with better weight rooms and, and uh, better video uh, units and all the things equipment-wise, et cetera, that uh, they feel can get them to the level uh, that they want to be and maybe go on and, and play in the professional ranks somewhere, depending on the sport. So the arms race really has, over the last uh, 10 to 20 years, been centered around facilities. And uh, as you look around today, uh, millions upon millions of dollars in this area uh, has been put in place. And, uh, at the University of Nebraska, we have as fine a facilities as there are in the United States. It doesn't mean that we uh, don't have some things that we need to address, and we are. Uh, but by and large, uh, everything we have is attractive to a potential student athlete when they come to visit our campus. Is that arms race problematic? It can be. I think if it's, if it's looked at in the context that we're providing what's very best for these young people to train and reach their goals and objectives, I think it's the right way to go. 
Uh, I think where it may get a, a little bit off balance is there is more to the experience than just great facilities. Uh, wonderful teachers, great coaches and mentors, and the experience of developing friendships with your teammates and other students. That's, at the end of the day, what people are going to remember with their experience at the University of Nebraska or wherever they may end up. With all of the spending, there's also an increasing gap between what you might call the haves and, and the have-nots. When you look at, um, you know, most recently, and I'll go back to your old school and compare it to Texas. In 2016, Texas spent $171 million. Washington State spent $100 million less than that. And the gaps between those schools and, and others on down the list have, have been gradually growing. Is that going to create a sort of unlevel playing field, you know, between, again, a, a certain number of schools that have the money and some that don't? Well, that was the, really the criteria for the Power Five and the autonomy movement uh, and the reform legislation from a few years ago that really separated the 65 universities from the rest. That those of us that really felt that the cost of attendance was a, a big issue uh, and some other things that were going to be uh, costly that uh, the majority of the NC2A Division I schools could not afford. So I think that was good. Now that we have the 65, they're starting to become uh, some haves and have-nots within the 65. And uh, whether it all can compete, uh, I think, is, is yet to be determined. Uh, the, such things as scholarship limitations, uh, equal television revenue, uh, things along these lines have brought parity, uh, whether the huge budgets are there or not. Pretty significant amount of the money that Nebraska spends, I think about a third at least, goes towards coaches' salaries. Um, you know, we saw with the hiring of Scott Frost the increase of the head coach's salary from about $3 million a year to about $5 million a year. Why, again, does that need to continue to, to rise? And we see that all across the country. Well, it's primarily driven by the marketplace and uh, the, the very good coaches that are out there that uh, uh, a, a university wants to attract, they're going to have to have a financial package uh, for the head coach and, and a very good uh, appealing pool of monies for the assistants just to get the very best. I'm sure you've been watching you know, what's been going on at, uh, at Michigan State and, and the connections of sexual assault cases to the athletic department. Yeah, your thoughts on that? Well, it's, uh, it's tragic. Uh, the, the biggest tragedy is uh, with the victims. And, uh, and next, it's, it's uh, very, very damaging to uh, what is a very highly regarded university. I'm talking about Michigan State and uh, with some wonderful people some of whom I know very, very well. Um, again, I think it's uh, a lot about communicating, uh, people understanding to report situations that uh, may not be in the best interest of all involved, and, uh, and, and to be watching for these things and reporting them because uh, uh, you, you can, can fall to ruins very, very fast in this business, and we saw it at Penn State a few years back, uh, the, the amount of money involved in lawsuits and really the tarnished reputation of, again, of uh, a tremendous university. And to their credit, they have bounced back, and uh, it, it's a, a real tribute to the leadership there and their plan to get, get that respect back, and they have, and I'm sure Michigan State will do the same. But again, uh, abuse of that nature uh, is, has no business in any workplace and certainly not in an a institution of higher education where young people have come to uh, learn and, to, and in this case to compete at the highest level and uh, to develop themselves as young men and women. And uh, I feel for them, the victims, and may, wanting to make sure that we uh, are educating our people here, not just the coaches and staff, but the student athletes as well, uh, that we don't uh, follow suit with a problem that could be similar. What are you doing to ensure that that 
isn't happening or doesn't happen here at Nebraska? It's messaging. Uh, we had an all coaches, uh, head coaches meeting uh, earlier this week uh, and had uh, our faculty athletics representative who has been in that role for over 20 years and, and is also a, uh, a lawyer and teaches law here at the University of Nebraska, really uh, lay it all out and uh, what what had happened in this situation and what to guard against so it doesn't happen here. So I really think uh, the education piece is important and then uh, making sure that everyone knows who to go to to report. And uh, uh, in, in every situation on every campus, there are those that uh, those kind of complaints and, and concerns can be reported to, and certainly we have that protocol here as well. You know, at, at both Penn State and Michigan State and, and other places, there, there were accusations and complaints and, and charges that to a certain degree were ignored. Do you feel confident that here at Nebraska that if somebody comes forward with something that's going on that they'll be taken seriously? Yes, I do, and uh, it's because, again, we have uh, educated them properly and we do have a course of action for them to take and uh, they, they know uh, what, what that course is and uh, the, the key thing is to make them comfortable if they do have a complaint or concern uh, to go and report that and that's, that's really at the core of all this and I, I really feel that we're in good shape in that regard. You know, with the scope of, of programs like Nebraska and, and other really big-time athletic programs, you know, there's there's always been issues with outside influences that have been problematic. You know, most recently we've seen the the FBI bribery probe that involved Louisville and basketball coaches and Adidas executive and, and some others. Um, how, as somebody that's the CEO of such a big operation, more than 300 employees, hundreds if not a thousand or more athletes. How do you watch all of that? Well, uh, make sure again you have people in the right place in regards to our compliance team uh, and that we educate our coaches and student athletes of uh, the temptations and such that can come along with uh, a, a bit of uh, celebrity and uh, the money that's, that's laying out there. So. The men's basketball uh, situation is, is only going to get worse before it gets better. I think that some of the things that are going to be under, uncovered will make what has been uncovered look uh, uh, mighty small in, in regards to the numbers. And uh, I always try to see some lemonade in every lemon and hopefully uh, this will be a wake-up call. I think. Uh, uh, college basketball on the men's side has been uh, running off course for a good many years. Uh, the so-called one and done uh, aspect of uh, players coming in and playing or going to school one year and essentially uh, not even finishing that year and going on into the NBA um, is not healthy. And uh, all of the uh, temptations from shoe and apparel companies and others. Uh, a lot of it having to do with AAU uh, basketball and a lot of club sports uh, really needs to be monitored and hopefully this will be uh, again a wake-up call that uh, we will start really addressing these concerns and get it cleaned up. You know we've talked a lot about the the scope of athletic programs here and at, at other big schools. You know why are programs like this a good thing and a good fit for a university as a whole? Well, I've uh, always kind of went by the, the saying that intercollegiate athletics does serve as, a, as the front window to the institution. People feel good about their school being successful. And there's so many ways to gauge success, but the one that is uh, showcased the most is intercollegiate athletics. And a lot of that, of course, has to do with the, uh, the fans and the exposure that we're getting on television and uh, throughout the media. And uh, when that's good, uh, people are feeling good about uh, what we're doing at our particular university. Uh, applications for uh, admissions tend to go up. 
uh, philanthropy throughout the entire university tends to increase and uh, just really a, an overall good buzz in conversation. So um, if done right and, uh, and a good clean intercollegiate athletic program uh, can showcase the institution on a national level like nothing else. So when you're done here at Nebraska, what do you hope to be remembered for? Well, I, I hope that uh, my time here at Nebraska, and I hope it's a long time, uh, will be one that uh, uh, we were extremely competitive, uh, that we provided wonderful opportunities for many, many young people, that uh, our program was a source of pride to the university and to the community and the entire state, and uh, hopefully walk away with some championships. I, I think we're so very capable of doing that, and uh, that'll make me very happy and feel that uh, maybe I did a small part for this great university to uh, uh, put it in, in the place where it is now and see that it continues. Maybe there'll be a Bill Moose room here somewhere. <laughs> hey, those are big shoes. I'm not counting on that, but uh, uh, I'm hoping that our stadium stays full and, and that uh, our fans stay happy and, and that the university as a whole continues to do the many wonderful things that it's currently doing. Bill Moose, thank you for your time. I appreciate My it. My pleasure. Thank you. You can watch a longer version of our interview with Bill Moose on the Speaking of Nebraska webpage, netnebraska.org slash speakingofnebraska. Here are some other stories NET News is working on. For a small basketball team from a small college in Omaha, this season is about a lot more than wins and losses. Next week, I'll tell you about the last shot for the Royals. And Brandon McDermott reports on early onset Alzheimer's and tells the stories of two Nebraskans dealing with the disease. You can find all of our signature stories at netnebraska.org slash news and connect with NET News and our journalists on Facebook and Twitter. Lots of University of Nebraska talk in the legislature this week, but it's not about sports. It's about millions of dollars of budget cuts. State government reporter Fred Knapp joins us now. And, you know, for starters, what got us to this point where we're talking about $35 million in, in cuts of state aid to the university? Well, the legislature passed a two-year budget last spring, and it balanced and met the reserve requirements of state law. But then state revenues started lagging, and in October, the forecast board reduced their projections for how much revenue the state would get, leaving a $173 million projected budget shortfall. So Governor Pete Ricketts proposed budget cuts, including $35 million to the university over the current and next fiscal year. And earlier this week, uh, all four of the campuses released long lists of, of different things that would be on the chopping block. Talk a little bit about some of those things. Well, it's a wide range of things uh, at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. There's uh, ending degree programs in geography and art history. At Omaha, it's cutting faculty in social work and business. Uh, at Kearney, it's cutting men's baseball, golf, and tennis. And at UNMC, it's cutting faculty and cancer research. So it's a pretty wide range of things, and there are more that they say would have to come if these cuts were to be enacted. And you covered the, the rather lengthy budget hearing that, that went on yesterday. What was the general feel there? What, were, what was being said? Well, the university and its supporters dominated the uh, testimony, uh, and they were making the argument that uh, the university is an engine for economic growth and should not be cut because that'll uh, shortchange the state in the, in the long run. Uh, the only uh, pushback to that came uh, from a question from Senator John Keene, who said, uh, how is this sustainable if you need an extra $30 million each year just to, just to cover increased costs? And, and President Bounds' answer to that was? He, he said, we're not, we're not just uh, treading water here. Uh, he didn't disagree that that was a challenge, but essentially that's up to the legislature. Yeah. So what's next in this budget battle? Well, there was a bit of good news uh, shortly after the budget hearing, which is that uh, state revenue exceeded projections for January by $42 million. It was also up by another uh, 24, uh, 25 in December. So they've made up $77 million of that uh, shortfall. If that it holds, then uh, Appropriations Committee Chairman Senator John Stinner says, 
they might not have to cut as much as uh, they had been thinking. The administration is saying, hold on, let's see how income tax uh, receipts come in, in in through April before we make any uh, too much happy talk. Right, because there is a little bit of a, of a thought that some of this is maybe a blip related to the, the federal tax law. Right, and, and that sales tax, which is an indication of economic activity, is not up by anywhere near as much as income tax is. So we're about halfway through this 60-day sh- session, which is the, the shorter of the two sessions. You know, last year we talked a lot about the extreme partisanship that was really a part of the officially nonpartisan unicameral. Uh, does it feel the same this year? No, it feels different. Those underlying tensions are still there. You remember the first day of last year's session when they reorganized and elect committee chairs, conservative Republicans beat moderate Republicans and Democrats uh, for those chairmanships. Um, So there was a lot of uh, uh, rancoring uh, about that. Um, But this year, those underlying tensions are still there, but it's more of a one-man show with Senator Ernie Chambers uh, filibustering, but he has a lot of tacit support among people that are still angry about last year's developments. And the end result is to imperil, once again, uh, Governor Ricketts' proposed uh, tax changes. Yeah. And you'll be down there for another 30 days following all the action for us. 30 that it will seem like longer than that. <laughs> all right, Fred, thank you very much. And during the session, you can listen to Fred's daily legislative updates on NET Radio at 5.45 and 7.45 a.m. and 5.45 p.m. and on our website at netnebraska.org slash news. Bob Gibson, Marlon Briscoe, and Gail Sayers, three Omaha athletes who were game changers in different ways. More in this Nebraska History Moment. Nebraska is known for producing great athletes, but three Omahans sealed their place in history as trailblazers. Bob Gibson attended Creighton University on a basketball scholarship, but also played baseball, the sport he would become famous for. After one year of playing basketball for the Harlem Globetrotters, Gibson went on to pitch 17 seasons at the St. Louis Cardinals. Gibson was Pitcher of the Year in 1968, the year deemed Year of the Pitcher. After that year, the pitching mound was lowered and the strike zone made more compact rules often referred to as the Gibson Rules. Marlon Briscoe attended Omaha University. He was drafted by the Denver Broncos in the 14th round where he played defensive back until the quarterback was hurt and the backup struggled. During his rookie season, he stepped into the quarterback role and became the first African American to start at the position in the American Football League. From there, he went to the Bills as a wide receiver and earned two Super Bowl rings with the Miami Dolphins. A graduate of Omaha Central, Gail Sayers was a halfback and return specialist for the Kansas Jayhawks and the Chicago Bears. He and Brian Piccolo, his backup, became the first black and white men to room together in the NFL, and their friendship inspired the movie Brian Saw. Sayers remains the youngest person ever inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame at age 34. His number is retired at Kansas and Chicago. Well, that's all for this edition of Speaking of Nebraska. Next week, we'll talk about homelessness in the state. Thanks for joining us. Good night.